This episode is brought to you by Trade Zero and Lupton Capital. Joe Lupton is a paid marketing partner of Trade Zero and may receive compensation for introducing customers to Trade Zero. This video represents only the views and opinions of Joe Lupton. Trade Zero does not endorse the content of this video. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. I am your host, Jonah Lupton. Today, I'm excited for our guest. It's Lucas Haldeman. He is the founder and CEO of Smart Rent. Lucas, how are you today? Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jonah. So where are you at headquarters right now? Yeah, we're in our headquarter building here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, cool. The weather looks a little bit nicer down there than it is here in Boston. So, yeah, um, it's a little chilly. It's in the mid sixties today, but other than that, it's good. It's like mid forties here, so you win. Yeah. Um, so let's start off. In case the the viewers or listeners aren't familiar with Smart Rent, why don't you tell us about the company? What do you guys do? Yeah, sure. So at Smart Rent, we are a enterprise smart home provider. And so let me, that's, that's a lot of buzzwords. So let me kind of unpack it. So the problem that, that we solved, and, and actually this, I got the idea of my background before smart run, I was on the operations side. So I was a CTO at a publicly traded REIT and um, we wanted to understand and better control and better monitor and protect our assets, but there was no enterprise solution for smart homes. So there was a lot of really cool hardware. Um, you can put a thermostat on the wall, you can put a door lock on, um, but none of it worked together and none of it was integrated uh, into our property management system, the software we use to manage the property. And so uh, what we do is we take lots of different hardware and technology that's been created by, by great companies that you've heard of, like Ring Doorbells and Yale Locks and Honeywell Thermostats, and we, we integrate it all into one platform. And then that, that so all the hardware comes into one app. So if you're a, a resident at an apartment, you have one app to control your home. But more importantly, if you're an owner, you now can control hundreds of thousands or thousands of these devices that you deploy out through your portfolio and, and getting that control. So do you guys create any of your own hardware or you're all using third party hardware? We do create some of our own hardware. Um, and th the reason that we we did that is there wasn't there were voids. Well, there, because because of the fact that all of this hardware was developed for cons in consumer use, um, there, there were just some, some holes. And so things like a, a smart home hub that was a commercial grade and durable and, and not just meant to be the cheapest hub you could possibly build and, and thrown in your living room, that really didn't exist. So we had to go build that from the ground up. Um, and, and then other, we've gotten into more and more products as we've gotten uh, larger because it helps us bring the cost down for owners. So that's the other reason to go build something like a leak sensor, which we didn't, we didn't invent, but um, was out there and, and existed, but we've, we've modified it and made it uh, more a more commercial grade. That's sort of the theme you'll keep hearing is is these are homes, but they're they're also commercial properties sometimes, and, and and the ability to bring the cost down to the owners to do that. Who's your typical customer? Are you going after the large apartment buildings, the condo buildings, or is it single family? I mean, what what's the market here? Yeah, our our customers are are institutional owners of of rental homes. And that could be single family homes for rent. That could be multifamily homes for rent. But uh, really, our target is, is the larger owners. Uh, really, not not because of the product, but because of the acquisition cost. So if you called me and you said, "Hey, I've got one apartment building and I want your product," great, we'll we'll roll the truck. We'll do it. Um, it's not that different from doing someone who has 50,000 when you get down to actually doing the, the buildings, but the acquisition cost is so high to find those people that we, we start with the, the biggest owners and kind of move into the long tail. So like the big publicly traded REITs? Yeah. Yeah. U UDR, Essex, uh, MAA, uh, Starwood. These are all, all partners of ours. Now, just out of curiosity, were any of them investors in the company as well? A lot of them are investors. Uh, we actually, the first round of outside capital we took came from a fund called Real Estate Technology Ventures. And all of the LPs of that fund are large apartment owners. And so if, if you're if you're starting a, a, a software company or, or any kind of company and you want to sell to to multifamily, it was it's a pretty, pretty great fund. But um, we actually they ran an RFP that all of the owners had come together and said, we need to figure out the smart home stuff. And so they ran an RFP on behalf of those LPs and we were invited to participate and we ended up winning that, that RFP to be the preferred provider. And that's when they invested in us. So 
indirectly, a lot of owners invested in us through that because they're investors in the fund. Um, and then once we started rolling out with some of these owners, they actually came and said, hey, we'd like to invest directly as well. And so we did take some direct investment from some of these partners. And, and that, I, mean, it's, I think it's great for both of us. It's great for us. It aligns our interests. And for them, it actually helps to bring down the cost of the technology because as we're successful and publicly traded and, and, and make them money uh, on paper that are holding our stock, then, then they're, that nets down essentially the cost they had to, to deploy the technology. I was just going to ask you, I mean, obviously your publicly traded company, ticker symbol SMRT, you guys came public last year uh, in a SPAC? We did, yeah. Uh, we, we finalized the, the D-SPAC and, and had our public debut of, um, August uh, 25th of last year. Okay. Uh, I mean, overall, how has it been, you know, the first 17, 18 months as a publicly traded company? I know the stock is down. You guys did run into some supply chain problems this year, right? We did, as as did everyone in the hardware business, and so so yeah, we we kind of got hit with a double whammy of the market quickly moved away from from growth and from tech, and we were sort of in both those categories, and then we were held back from the units we could deploy because we couldn't get the hardware, um, and so I think I, I I really I like the, in general the businesses that that combine hardware software i think it's a really interesting category that's that's emerging um but the one downside is is if you don't have the hardware you know you, you really can't deploy it so now right now if i remember correctly your q3 revenues were in the ballpark of 45 to 50 million yes what yeah. percentage what percentage of that was hardware versus software yeah the bulk of that revenue is still in in hardware and also in professional services which is our our implementation team that we actually go out and install all the okay. hardware and, and make it work so you know we're, we're definitely a, a a company where the the SaaS, like all SaaS businesses it, it it's high margin great revenue uh but takes a while to build critical mass uh and so the upfront hardware is is a lot of upfront capital and so it, it always kind of is going to dwarf that 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 pure SaaS. So I almost look at it as, as two separate businesses and, and just look at the, the SaaS on its own and the hardware and professional services on its own. But um, certainly the SaaS, I mean, our SaaS is, has grown almost four times from where we were at this point last year. So it's, it's becoming more and more meaningful. We're now north of 30 million on an ARR basis run rate. And so I think it's, it's becoming uh, a, a pretty interesting piece of the business. And I, I think that's where We've heard a lot of investor sentiment. It, it's rare to find a SaaS company like us that, that's growing how we are, but also has such predictability because we get these commitments from the owners to do their full portfolios over multi-year that it, we can. it's rare to be able to tell you, like I can tell you where my growth is coming by zip code <laughs> over the next two years. So it, it gives you it, a lot of predictability, which, which is attractive to the investment community, obviously. Now, are you guys doing more on the new construction side or the retrofit side? We do more on the retrofit side. We do a lot of new construction, but just to give you a sense of the the addressable markets, it, it's one of it's a math problem that says if you're successful at selling into multifamily, um, you're going to do a lot of retrofitting. So we think, um, like in a good year, or we'll do about two hundred fifty thousand new units will come to fruition in the U.S. Um, and so if you said, hey, we're doing 50% of all new units, which no one is, that'd only be 125,000 units in a year. And that the backdrop of that is existing apartments that are institutionally managed. We think there's around 30 million of those in the U.S. And so it's just a much bigger market. So um, love doing the new construction. I think every new property should have smart technology. I think it's it's ridiculous the number of apartments that are coming online, brand new apartments that don't don't have it. There's sort of no friction to put it in when it's being built. It's just a matter of, of making the decision to do it. Um, and the cost is uh, on compared to the cost of the overall new construction is is so de minimis. But we, so I think new construction is 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 great and the product works great and we do a lot of it. It's just there's a lot more existing doors for us to go do as well. So like I was talking to you before we started the interview, you know, I live in a building in Boston. It was built probably six years ago. Uh, you know, it's considered a luxury building, but there really isn't any smart tech in here other than a, a Nest device, which really just manages the, you know, the temperature in the unit. That That's the extent of it. So 
what would it take, you know, for your sales team to reach out to a, a building manager like this? And then how long is the the lead time before something might actually happen? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you've worked in, in multifamily, you know, it is a slow industry to move. I mean, it, it is, it is a little bit baffling that, that a six year old building would have almost no technology considering smart home tech is, is really more than 25 years old where it's been mass deployed in single family owned homes. So anyway, it, it, it is one of those stats. And in terms of the question on, on time to market, the, the longest time for us is, is the, the sales cycle of just getting the owner to understand the ROI, understand the payback. And then how we typically move through is, is you work, work through typically an RFP and, and that, that can take a, a, a while, you know, three to six months. Then we move to a pilot where we'll say, okay, um, like the owner of your building may own 50 properties around the country. And I'll say, well, let's try it in four and, and see if you really are, are, see if I really get the ROI. After that, we, we then move into a full portfolio deployment. And so typically our typical contract to get the first deal signed can, can run six to nine months easily before we're actually out doing, doing the pilot. Um, so that, that, that slowness is, is, is frustrating up front. Um, but it is, it is kind of like, as I was alluding to a little bit earlier, the, the other side of it is once they make that commitment, they're fully committed and, and, and you're, you have years of, of runway ahead of you. I mean, you would think that residents at some point start to push back or, you know, when I'm going to look at the next place to live in, I look at three or four buildings. And if one of them has, you know, the, the, the best and the greatest smart tech and the other three don't, you know, that's, that's an advantage for the building that has the smart tech. But I'm surprised that these buildings aren't, I don't know, more eager to be on the cutting edge, I suppose, of technology, you know, knowing how maybe it's because that, you know, the the occupancy rates in this built in these buildings are so high that maybe they feel like they don't have to do anything. I mean, they're already based. I mean, the uh, the vacancy rate in this building is under one percent. Um, yeah. So maybe they think, well, why why invest in the building? Why spend money on smart tech if we don't have to? I mean, we're filling up regardless. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think it's that. I mean, I work with a lot of these owners that because I'm, they're working with us, they are rolling, you know, they are on the, the cutting edge. And even that, it takes time to get it through the portfolio. But I will, I will say, in fairness to the, to the multifamily owners is we've also been burned by a lot of tech that, that didn't actually do what it said it was going to do. Kind of like the thermostat that you have in your, in your apartment there in, in Boston doesn't really help the owner out, but that owner bought it because they were told it was going to be really helpful to them. And so there's a, there's a bit of a, a, a there's a caution there to, to kind of not move too fast. But I will tell you, every conversation we have, every owner you can call on is working on some form of this and knows they need to do it. So I think we've, we've, we've reached the tipping point of, of it's not tell me why I want this or tell me what this is about, but just sort of when can we do it? And then it's just a matter of, it will take it will take years to come retrofit all these you know 30 million apartments is a lot of apartments but <laughs> you are seeing consumer demand is definitely favoring it some of our best marketing comes from uh we get calls from from buildings that are having trouble leasing when we go into a building and put our tech in like a neighbor neighboring property and then the other thing is we get we get emails into our customer care uh center every day saying hey uh, can you tell me where else you are because i'm moving and I don't want to live in a non-smart apartment anymore. So you definitely have the, the consumer demand there. Oh, yeah. That downgrading from smart tech to no smart tech is probably worse than not having it in the beginning because then you don't know what you're yeah. missing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, earlier, I think it was earlier this year, you guys acquired a company called is it Site, Site Plan? Yeah, Site Plan. What, uh, what, what did they do and why did you guys make that acquisition? Yeah, Site, site Plan is a, a software company that, that we acquired that so same same customers sell the same customers and actually we're already on the technology side we're already integrated with them we've been integrated with them for years because we have about 39 customers that use both site plan and smart rent and we really saw firsthand that that those customers site plan worked better with smart rent and smart rent worked better with site plan so site plan is really more on the 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 day-to-day -day property management side of of the software so it's a, a really robust way to handle work orders, to handle answering calls, to handle the resident experience. And, and we have a lot of overlap. Um, if you think about if, you, if we if a resident app, you know, you have an app on your phone. Uh, what are the two things that you're really primarily going to use it for 
three things is one is you're going to use the smart tech to get in, into your building, into your apartment and change your thermostat, all the, all the smart home things. But then you're also going to use, you need to put in a work order. Something's wrong. You put in a work order. And the other, so that's what site plan does. We do the first thing. And then the only other thing is, is paying rent. And so we integrate with, with the rent providers, the rent payment providers as, as well. So it makes it a more cohesive sort of platform uh, rather than just being sort of an IoT smart home vendor. Gotcha. And I know on the website, you talk about parking management. What, what does that do? Yeah, we have a smart smart parking management. So, so um, similar to in the unit, it, it's, it's third-party hardware that's existed, but coming in, being integrated with the property management systems is what is so vital there. So we actually, a couple of different things we can do. We can help monetize guest parking. So one of the phenomenons we've seen is that the, the building codes really haven't changed in terms of the number of parking spaces you need to provide per for the number of units you have, uh, but but especially in urban areas, car ownership has significantly decreased. So there's a lot of there's a lot of spots that owners don't know what to do with, and so we can put our smart parking solution in there and allow them to to then monetize that, let people off the street come park there um, and, and do that. The other thing is just helping control the parking lot, so we can put the sensors in the parking lot and then we we issue residents um smart window tags and so if you parked in the wrong spot you'd actually get an alert on the app saying hey this isn't your assigned spot you need to go to your spot so uh taking some of the headaches out of out of property management now you guys have uh i know in the press release your q3 press release you said that you've deployed is it five hundred thousand units altogether? yeah we're over over five hundred thousand units deployed that's since the company was started yes what what is yeah. the goal? What's the goal for next year, for instance? Assuming that you don't have any big supply chain problems. Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't we haven't given our our full year guidance, but I think you know you're going to see continue to see us see us grow um, and 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 add to that number. I think there's a unbelievable amount of demand for us. It's it's how do we get make sure we have all the hardware we need and then the the human power to actually go in, install it and deploy it. Um, so it's it's not a it's not a wave a wand kind of a product. There's definitely a process to get it installed, but but you'll definitely see us see us continuing to grow. Okay, and you guys are those five hundred thousand units. Is that just U.S. or are you guys doing international stuff already? It's it's primarily U.S. We we have a little bit in Canada and a little bit in the U.K. Um, so so we are kind of moving a little bit outside the border, but sort of you know Canada and U.K. are pretty pretty fr friendly spots to land in terms of, of language and, and understanding, but the, the vast majority is, is US based. And would you guys expand international? Are you doing that with your own sales team or are you using the channel partners? Today we're doing it with our own sales team. I, I think, um, you know, the channel partner strategy to expand internationally is certainly on our radar though, outside of uh, uh, other markets. It's something we're definitely looking at. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty much all I got. Uh, I mean, unless the, did I skip over anything or anything you want to mention about the business? No, I think this is great. I, I think you hit all the high points um, and, and great questions. Okay. I mean, I will, um, when we release the interview, I'll include a link to the investor relations page. If anyone wants to go read through the recent press release. I mean, I know you guys are, I know that your numbers this year are probably going to be lower than what the guidance was at the beginning of the year. Most of that's probably because of the supply chain problems. But I mean, you guys are still, you know, you're doing 50 million a quarter. I mean, that's those yeah. are some decent numbers. Uh, you think you'll see growth next year as well over this year's numbers? Yeah, we, we, we anticipate seeing growth for sure. And those SaaS now, the SaaS revenue, are those typically longer term contracts? Yeah, they're typically three to five years. Okay. Yeah. So you make money on the hardware up front, and then you get those SaaS, those recurring SaaS revenues for the next three to five years, at least, if not longer. Yeah, at least is the right because it is a case of once you're in with an apartment community, they if you're if you're doing a, a good job, they they really don't tend to change. I mean, it's, it's hard to change. You have to retrain employees. You have a lot of friction to get people trained, and so it's a great business. the 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 difficulty getting in is also becomes an advantage once you're in you know what i mean like it's slow to get in but once you're in it's a it's an amazing industry to work in where do you think where do you think margins can go over the next few years i mean do you have any goals i'm just pulling up right now numbers so gross margins this year i mean pretty low right i mean bar barely above uh so like one or two percent gross margins this year i mean 
can you get to 15, 20% gross margins in the next two or three years? Yeah, that that's the goal. I mean, I think we got hit really hard with, with the supply chain. And so you, just to get hardware in, that margin got eroded. You know, like the cost of our hardware went up, the air shipping instead of, instead of you know, ocean freight, all that stuff kind of kind of hit us. And so, but yeah, I mean, that, that then as the SaaS continues to grow, it, it pulls that margin up nicely. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. I appreciate your time today. Uh, best wishes and continued success with the company. And uh, maybe we'll talk again sometime next year. I'll look forward to it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jonah. You got it. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Please subscribe to Jonah Lupton's different investment services. The first one is Substack. The URL is substack.luptoncapital.com. The second one is StockTwits. The URL is stocktwits.luptoncapital.com. And the third one is for Seeking Alpha. The URL is seekingalpha.luptoncapital.com. And you can see all of those links if you just go to the Lupton Capital website at luptoncapital.com.